Whitby, 24th of July. This is a lovely place. The Little River Esk runs through a deep valley which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. The houses of the old town are all red roofed and seem piled up one over the other anyhow, like the pictures we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of the abbey, which was sacked by the Danes, a noble ruin of immense size. Between it and the town is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. It descends so steeply over the harbour that part of the bank has fallen away and some of the graves have been destroyed. They have a legend here that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out at sea. That's a passage from Dracula the famous novel of horror and superstition by Bram Stoker, published in 1897. And the extraordinary fact is that his impression of Whitby has remained almost unchanged since the book first appeared. There can be very few English towns which have managed to preserve their 19th century character so completely as this one. Whitby's fame begins with an abbey, where in 664 an important conference took place known as the Synod of Whitby. Here a momentous decision was made for Britain, favouring the Roman form of Christianity in preference to the Irish. Two hundred years later, the original abbey was destroyed by the Danes. The present church was built for Benedictine monks in the 13th century. There are hallmarks here of the early English style, the first phase of our Gothic architecture. We can see the lancet windows, stepped up in the gable, and the dog-tooth mouldings, and the simple quadripartite vaults. The stone is strong, it's Jurassic sandstone in three distinct colours, lugged up here on carts from surrounding quarries. The best known is the sandy brown stone from Aislaby. After the Reformation, the abbey was abandoned to the wind and the rain and the pillagers of stone. The wonder is that so much survived so well. After the dissolution, the abbey and its lands were bought by one Richard Chumley, whose son Francis, at the time of the Spanish Armada, built a house. Abbey House, as seen today, is not Chumley's. It's unashamedly Victorian.
But across a courtyard, we find the facade of a very odd building. In the time of Charles II, another of the Chudleys, Sir Hugh, built a grand banqueting house, 120 feet long, with an external centerpiece in a style verging on the Baroque. It's difficult to believe that it housed many banquets. For one thing, who would have come to this inaccessible, windswept spot? Anyway, after less than a hundred years, it was badly damaged in a gale. And soon after that, the Chumleys moved away forever to one of their other estates. Hence the blind windows of this roofless shell. Not beautiful, but strange, haunting, almost eerie. Virtually the only other occupant of this cliff top is St. Mary's Church. St. Mary, as we see it today, isn't of any great consequence as a work of architecture, with its big squat tower and its external staircases affording access to internal galleries. But the interior is a thrill, absolutely unforgettable. What we have here isn't a work of art, but it is a most illuminating social document. Here can be seen, as nowhere else in England, just what the Georgians thought about a medieval church and what they were prepared to do with it. That this interior should have come through the age of Victorian party unscathed is little short of miraculous. The best place from which to take it all in is the three-decker pulpit, a most endearing piece dating from 1788 with a very pretty crested sounding board. Until 1847, this stood at the eastern end of the central aisle. Below a Norman chancel arch, there was once a screen surmounted by a rood, the image of Christ crucified flanked by the Virgin Mary and St. John. What we see here now is a family pew. This, as some would say, blasphemous object, was installed by the Chumleys rather before the Georgian period, late in the 17th century, in fact. It's still occasionally used by a descendant. In the earliest pews, those with straight ends and two knobs are Jacobean, but most are Georgian. I think myself it's a pity that they're not all painted white, as most of those in the galleries are. I'd prefer all or none. The galleries started to appear about 1697, as Whitby became more populous. They went on increasing until 1818, by which time the church could seat 2,000 people, as it still can, and occasionally it does. Yet, despite the fact that St Mary's was of all England's parish churches one of the most arduous to reach, these people crowded in. For centuries, the only approach was by a precipitous donkey track or by the famous steps. These, all 199 of them, are the property of the rector and church wardens. 
and their maintenance is a constant drain on church funds. They too are of Aselby sandstone, but originally they were of wood. Up these steps, generation after generation, came not only the living, but ultimately also the dead. So when we look at such of the Georgian tombstones as have survived the rigours of the weather in this historic spot, it is well that we should remember that all the coffins of those commemorated had to be lugged up this dauntingly steep hill. Who were these people? What did they do? Quite unlike the citizens of Sarancester and so many other English towns, they had nothing to do with sheep nor wool. The prosperity of Whitby, which reached its peak during the 18th century, depended upon the sea. Men of Whitby habitually went fishing, and especially whaling. And until the opening of the Turnpike Road in 1759, access to this town was usually by sea. Even today, fishing is still an important local occupation. Shipbuilding and ship repairing were also major industries here in the 17th and 18th centuries. It was Whitby men who built the wooden vessels which carried Captain Cook, a local celebrity, on his great voyages of discovery. It was for the mariners and fishermen and the shipyard workers that the old town came into being. Many of these cottages are situated in what are known as the yards which are a feature of Whitby. Before about 1700, the typical house plot here was a long, narrow strip. When, with increasing prosperity, the population rose, many of these strips were sold off for additional housing, often accessible only by a passage under a corner of the original house. It would be misleading to say that all the dwellings in these yards were equipped with mod cons. In another yard, the loo is decorated to match the house. But what a long way to go in the rain. Some of the yards still keep their big, uneven sets of hard Yorkshire sandstone. And what nearly all these cottages also keep are delightful red pantiles on their roofs. Another yard, McLachlan's, terminates in a house which provides a truly ghastly example of what's known as ribbon pointing. Did you ever see such a brutal way of treating stone as this? But the houses here also exhibit what is a speciality of the stonework in this part of England. Herringbone tooling over the entire surface of each block. This was done with a punch, a hammer-headed tool with a very narrow cutting edge. The mason work from the long edges of each block diagonally to form a V shape. 
Whitby has many examples of this kind of tooling, and very pleasing it is. So far as I know, it's not found except in the northeast. By this time, another feature had caught on here to an extent that I have never encountered elsewhere, the very long window. of all is this one, known as the bottle window, with no fewer than 60 panes of glass. What now of the larger houses? There's little before the Georgian period, when the town was at last becoming prosperous. Larpool Hall is a mile to the south and was built of stone in the 1780s. It's marred by a Victorian porch and a bay window with sheet glass. The masonry is excellent and the site superb. St Columban's, which was built for a ship owner and formerly called Airy Hill, is also sandstone, carboniferous here, also nearly 200 years old, and also had a Victorian porch added. But this one is good, a real embellishment to the house. The other side is also sumptuously enriched, with no expense spared. We find not only a graceful Corinthian portico and ground floor windows with gibbs surrounds and triple stepped keystones, but several much more unexpected motifs. At each end of the parapet are curved ramps containing urns. The stepped keystones also adorn the Eau de Boeuf in the pediment. And most fantastic of all, there is the elaborately carved architrave of the central window on the first floor. I've never seen anything like it. But this house has been unlucky. A few years ago, with the construction of a new road, it exchanged most of its garden for the noise of incessant traffic. It became a school, and then for six or seven years stood empty. I only hope that it will be saved. Closer to the centre, the larger Georgian houses are also no longer residential. This one, again mainly brick, but with stone dressings, was once a very handsome house. As for this one of Ashlard Stone, it's said to have once been the finest house in Whitby. Just look at it now. In 1870, it became the Crown Hotel, and now it's the Working Men's Club. The Georgian front has been brutally masked. And here, another house fallen from glory. In much better shape today are the terraces. This is Brunswick Terrace, with three houses only. A trifle naive, perhaps, but very endearing. When I first saw those flights, I thought, pity the poor postman. 
until I found with relief that there are also doors opening onto a high-level street behind. Bagdale keeps a handsome range of houses which don't exactly form a terrace, built from 1780 onwards. Long flights of steps again. The ashlard stonework is all much blackened. I suppose the best address in Whitby is now St Hilda's Terrace. This again is not continuous. It's evident that, as so often in London, the plots were sold off separately and each purchaser did his own thing. So there's considerable diversity. But these 25 houses were all for the world to do, with steep gardens in front and entrances from the back. Some of them again have door cases of high quality. What a tremendous visual asset door cases like these are, aren't they? Add a porch, and you may keep cosier, but at a frightful cost to the appearance of your house. Here's a dear little late Georgian terrace house in brick. And if you should inherit just such a house and want to spoil it, to spoil it completely, well, this is the way to do it. The old Smuggler's Inn is, of course, very much older. But I include it here because of the windows. They're sash framed, but instead of moving up and down on cords, they slide sideways. It's the only way with low rooms. Because of the prevalence of this kind of window in this country, they're often known as Yorkshire windows. None of these houses had any connection with the development of Whitby as a tourist resort. That didn't begin until the arrival of steam trains here in 1847. At this time, George Hudson, known as the Railway King, was at the height of his success. He bought an extensive area of land on the West Cliff and started to develop it for visitors. The Royal Hotel was opened in 1848 and is still in business. But not many years later, Hudson, who was a crooked financier, went bankrupt. The Royal Crescent was begun in the 1870s by another entrepreneur, Sir George Eliot, but it was never completed. The whole of the Westcliff development is architecturally very dull. It culminated in the Metropole Hotel of 1897-98, a poor thing indeed compared with the Grand at Scarborough. It's now flats. Elsewhere, however, Victorians did make some good contributions. The Siemens Hospital, an almshouse, is a delightful surprise. The Victorian Jacobean façade, with at the centre a nautical flourish, dates from 1842 and is an early work of whom do you think? George Gilbert Scott, famous mainly for his church architecture. It's a good red brick laid in English bond with ample stone dressings. But it is only a facade. They travelled economy class behind. Victorian houses 
are not often listed by the Department of the Environment, and in my opinion, usually rightly not. But here is a Victorian villa, which surely ought to qualify. The banded rustication of the ground story. The ionic pilasters of the door case. the boldly aired architraves of the upper windows, and not least, the present-day grey livery over cement rendering with details picked out in white. All these surely add up to a small house of real distinction. Next door, we see the difference. The fact that the architraves are painted here the same colour as the wall means that their architectural value has been lost. Here's one of Whitby's nastiest buildings, but the stone's throw away is something very different. This, believe it or not, is a supermarket built around 1980. Within, it's just like any other supermarket, but externally they troubled to provide this fascinating grouping of pantile roofs in the full spirit of Whitby. These photographs by Frank Meadow Sutcliffe were taken at the turn of the century. If we compare his view from the cliff top with ours, well, we've lost a little windmill. But gained, yes, the pantalescape of the new supermarket. In a single phrase, Whitby has preserved its identity. Joy of joys, there are no high-rise buildings anywhere. Here, of all places, they would be an affront. Pleasant little modern houses step sensitively down the hillside. The colours are right, the scale is right, the materials are right. There's a real feeling here for the genius loci the spirit of the place.